Hello, your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, here again, back for another episode of the History of Comics podcast, this time with part two of the rivalry between Marvel and DC. When we last left off, uh, Marvel and DC had both established sounds as the preeminent American comic book publishers, and uh, Marvel had just recently surpassed DC, which had long been, which had long been number one in comic book sales. Now they would, they would continue their rivalry, but for a little while, they would even get along. Martin Goodman, the founder of Marvel, continued to attack DC by flooding the market with Marvel books, and Stanley would inadvertently do something that would not only further define the difference between Marvel and DC, but change American comic books forever. The U.S. Department of Health had recently approached Marvel about producing an anti-drug story, realizing a lot of kids read comic books. It says something that even the U.S. government knew to approach DC over Marvel at the time. And Stanley agreed, commissioning a story for Amazing Spider-Man numbers 96 to 98 from May to July of 1971. However, the Comics Code Authority forbid any depiction of drug use, even negative ones, and wouldn't give the story its seal of approval. Seeing as how they had the U.S. Department of Health support, Marvel printed the story anyway, without, com- without the CCA approval seal. From DC's perspective, Marvel's move was outrageous, specifically by Carmen Infantino, who stated that they wanted to do an anti-drug story themselves, but wanted to do it out cold approval. In fact, they planned to run one in Green Lantern, Green Arrow about Speedy, Arrow's sidekick, being a heroin addict, complete with a cover of him shooting up by Neil Adams, but the CCA rejected it. However, when Infantino's criticism would soon look out of place when Amazing Spider-Man the Amazing Spider-Man story was universally acclaimed for its message, while the CCA was criticized for being behind in the times and trying to prevent such an important story from being printed. The resulting backlash led to the CCA to revamp its code for the first time since its inception 17 years ago on February of 1971, not only allowing for more morally gray stories like drug ones, but finally allowing horror characters to return to American comic books. Plus, that Green Arrow, Green Lantern story finally got published. Marvel would soon take advantage of this rule change with such classic horror series like Tomb of Dracula, while DC was able to introduce a character like the Swamp Thing in House of Secrets number 92 on July of 1971, created by Lynn Wein and artist Bernie Wrightson. Though you were probably never heard them thank Marvel over it. In fact, there was a controversy over Swamp Thing, as Marvel accused DC of ripping off their own Man Thing, created by Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Jerry Conway, and Greg Gray Morrow back in Savage Tales number 1 on May of 1971. DC countered, stating that they were both variations of the character The Heap, a Golden Age creature created by Harry Stein and Morv Leave in Air Fighters number 3 in December of 1942, and both sides finally decided to leave each other alone over it. Marvel did get another jab at DC when Martin Goodman learned that while DC held the copyright to the Fawcett character Captain Marvel, which they acquired after falsely suing the company over claiming it was a ripoff of Superman, they had lost the trademark to the name. The character was originally created at Fawcett in February of 1940 by Bill Parker and C.C. Beck in Wiz Comics No. 2, starring a, a kid Billy Batson who, when uttering the word Shazam, transformed into an adult hero Captain Marvel. While he had only a passing resemblance to Superman, along with actually flying while Superman was still just leaping tall buildings with a single bound at the time, that didn't stop DC head Jack Leibowitz from suing Fawcett over copyright infringement, eventually forcing him to cease publication of the character in 1953. The character remained popular, leading to a deal in 1972 where DC required the rights to Captain Marvel, but in the interim time, the trademark had expired. A brief explanation about the difference between a copyright and a trademark. Copyright is the, what the intellectual property actually is, while the trademark is what you call it. Similar to a patent being for what a Toyota Corolla is, while the trademark is the name of the Corolla. By law, trademarks expire a lot faster when not used, which is what happened to Captain Marvel, with the name reappearing in 1996 under MF Enterprises as an attempt to squat on it. However, Marvel intended to claim that name for itself, thus paid MF $4,500 in illegal settlement. Then Goodman ordered Stanley to create a Captain Marvel for Marvel, thus fully claiming the trademark for themselves. The new character appeared in Marvel Super Heroes number 12 on January of 1967, with Gene Colan providing the art. The Marvel version was an alien Kree warrior and would get his own series in 1968, which ran for two years. DC would protest and even try to sneak Captain Marvel's name into their own comic, but Marvel quickly tried legal action. 
They even tried to cheat, calling him the original Captain Marvel on the comics covers, but even that was nixed by Marvel. Thus changing uh, Shazam's name to the world's mightiest mortal with Shazam number 15 in December of 1974. Thus, the character is known in DC as Shazam to this day, along being awkward for the hero as he can't say his name without transferring back into Billy Batson. While Captain Marvel is currently on the fourth version with Carol Danvers' character. An additional more recent sting, the recent Captain Marvel movie from Marvel Studios grossed $1.41 billion worldwide, while Shazam from DC Warner Brothers of that same year did just $364 million. While all this fighting between Marvel and DC did drive the competition to improve their books for the readers, they did want them to get along a little bit, if only for so some of their favorite characters could finally meet. As the fan community grew in comic books, that many started asking, what would happen if Captain America and Superman met, or who is the fastest, the Flash or Quicksilver? Marvel and DC weren't quite listening yet, but there was some cooperation starting between the companies, if not with their approval. In Avengers number 69 in October of 1969, by Roy Thomas and Sal Buscema, it introduced Squadron Sinister, a knockoff of the Justice League, but as villains. For example, Hyperion is a stand-in for Superman, while Nighthawk is a version of Batman. In Justice League of America number 75 in November of 1969, the Avengers were referenced in return when battling evil versions of themselves, but in a subtler ways. For example, Batman threw a trash can lit like Captain America, and Superman's evil twin proclaims he's as powerful as Thor. Then in issue number 87 on February 1971, the Champions of Angor were introduced as Avengers stand-in. Marvel would follow suit with Avengers number 85 on February 1971, which introduced the Squadron Supreme, a team of good guys ready to the Squadron Sinister, complete with being JLL ripoffs. Marvel then later would bring back the Squadron Supreme in 1985 with a miniseries, complete with an ad proclaiming they were the Justice League done right, which naturally angered DC. This didn't stop the clandestine crossover in Marvel and DC, which is more overt in a series of issues starting in Amazing, Spy- Amazing Adventures number 16 on January 1973, and going to uh, JLA number 103 on December 1972, and Thor 207 on December 1972, all by Steve Englehart, Jerry Conway, and Lynn Wein. While each story stood on its own, together it told a larger narrative, all without DC or Marvel's approval. Another unofficial Marvel DC crossover came when writer Steve Englehart and his character The Mantis, a green skinned martial artist who first appeared in Avengers number 112 on June of 1973, was co created and penciled by Don Heck. She would eventually become a member of the team, later making her live action debut in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 on, on uh, 2017. However, after Englehart went to DC to write the Justice League of America, he would have her appear in issue number 142 on June of 1973, this time under the name Willow. When asked where she came from, Willow answers, This one comes from a place that she must not name, to reach a place no man must know. This would be part of Englehart choosing to continue his creation despite moving from different companies. Willow would leave Justice League two issues later to give birth, only to reappear in Scorpio Rose number two at Eclipse Comics now, this time called Lorelei, and having given birth to her son. She then appeared in the Coyote Collection at Image Comics, and Lorelei's name has even been dropped in Englehart's novel The Long Man in 2010. Mantis Willow Lorelei has gotten around, to say the least. While all this was happening, DC and Marvel and specifically Carmen Infantino and Stan Lee, decided to cooperate in another aspect when they agreed to share their page rates, originally to avoid having freelancers try to play them off each other. It came about when freelance artist uh, Frank Robbins lied to Marvel about what DC was paying him for a better deal. However, when Roy Thomas found out about this, he resigned as editor-in-chief in protest at Marvel, and the rate sharing never came about. It would be illegal collusion between companies on top of everything else. The cooperation continued between DC and Marvel in other ways, such as when both companies discovered they were working on an adaptation of the classic Wizard of Oz story, and they agreed to make it a co-production in 1975, called MGM's Marvelous Wizard of Oz, the first official co-production between the two companies. All this laid the groundwork for their two flagship characters to finally meet, Superman and Spider-Man. It all began with literary agent David Ost worked with Marvel and Stan Lee to produce a series of hardcover books from Simon & Schuster, such as Origins of Marvel Comics and Sons of Origins of Marvel Comics. With these connections, Ost met with Harmon Howard Kaminsky, the head of Warner Books, who proposed putting a book of Superman and Spider-Man meeting. 
When Oops floated the idea to Stan Lee, he liked it, but worried it would be it would help DC more than Marvel until Roy Thomas pointed out that it worked for Marvel as well, as it essentially elevated Spider-Man to Superman's level, since he was still the number one superhero after all. Opes served as a neutral arbitrator as there were plenty of details to work out, and he would later joke that ecumenical conferences from the Middle Ages were easier. DC demanded more than half the profits and the Superman would be first in the title, since he had higher distribution, which Marvel actually agreed to. DC still carried this ego that they were the best that Marvel ne- never let it get in the way at the time. In addition, the labor was to be evenly split, with Marvel providing the penciler and colorist while DC provided the writer, inker, and letterer. By this point, Jerry Conway had left Marvel for DC. Carmen Fantino was reportedly shocked when he found out he was just 21, despite already having celebrated runs on Fantastic Four and The Amazing Spider-Man, the latter of which included the death of Gwen Stacy and the creation of The Punisher. And Fantino tapped Conway to be the writer of the crossover, believing it was a way to stick it to Marvel, but Conway would be an ideal choice, being a former Spider-Man writer as well. DC then requested Ross Andrew to, as the artist, which also seemed a natural choice considering he was the current penciler on Amazing Spider-Man. But that also meant taking him off Marvel's top book, which so incensed editor and Spider-Man writer Lynn Wein, he reportedly nearly attacked the executive who made the decision. Dick Diogeno was made inker while Roy Thomas was serving as consulting editor, as bad blood still existed between Jerry Conway and some of the Marvel editors over leaving for DC. The plot had Spider-Man and Superman battling Dr. Octopus and Lex Luthor, though the details of the story would still have to be worked out. One DC creator accurately pointed out that Superman could throw Spider-Man to Jupiter if he wanted to. Conway worked out that Superman would pull his punches, only sending Spider-Man a few hundred feet instead of into orbit. In addition, both characters would have equal screen time down to the number of pages and panels. It was also decided that, at least for this book, Spider-Man and Superman existed in the same universe or were even aware of each other before actually meeting. Conway also included a fun subplot in which the heads of the Daily Planet and the Daily Bugle, Morgan Edge and J. Jonah Jameson, have a barroom meeting where they complain about their employees, Clark Kent and Peter Parker, always disappearing during a crisis. Finally, Superman vs. The Amazing Spider-Man, The Battle of the Century, was released on January of 1976 for a then astounding price of $2, along with an awkward tabloid-sized format that made it hard for some retailers to place in the standard comic book racks. The book began with an introduction by Carmen Infantino and Stan Lee touting the companies teaming up, and despite all these difficulties, Superman vs. Spider-Man would sell off 500,000 copies, making it all seem worthwhile. This brief aside, the success aside, though, Carmen Infantino found himself fired for one too many failures. DC lost a million dollars in 1975, along with making more than a few enemies in the business who helped, who helped uh, usher him in the way out. DC's had tried books like The Stalker and Richard Dragon that last meant to catch up to the, Marvel, the martial arts movie craze. However, it was more likely trying to just follow Marvel, who originally capitalized on it with Sang chi which had successfully run for two years. By this time, Dra- by the time Dragon came out, the craze had passed with the series failing, though the character is a mainstay in DC now. All of this led the DC to find some new blood, resulting in the hiring of Jeanette Kahn. R.A. successful children's book publisher, she was brought on at the consultant Warner Brothers on the weather to end DC Comics outright. Khan, a long-time, long-time comic book fan herself, argued against it, stating that without the original comic books, all the toys, cartoons, and other mutualized venues would eventually dry up. Apparently, this impressed Warner Brothers enough to make her the new publisher of DC, beginning on February 2, 1976. One of the first things Jeanette Khan did was try to treat DC creators better, along with making the comic books better themselves, setting up a system that forced new stories to climb a ladder before finally being made into a finished comic book. To do this, Khan set out to bring in new talent, recruiting Steve Englehart from Marvel, who revamped Justice League of America in 1977, and then in Detective Comics, helping bring about Batman to his dark roots. Englehart also brought a much-needed dose of maturity to the comic, creating Batman's new girlfriend, Silver St. John, and in a breakthrough for DC at the time, confirmed that Batman was having sex with, with a scene of St. Cloud telling Bruce Wayne she was exhausted from the previous night. Granted, over at Marvel, this was nothing new, as the sexual activity of such characters as Nick Fury and Iron Man had long been confirmed, while Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman had long since married and had children in Fantastic Four. Khan also had national publications 
officially renamed DC in 1976, and of course it had officially been called that for years, complete with a new logo designed by Milton Glasser, the legendary designer who known for the I Heart New York campaign for $25,000. Plus, the D.C. staff were finally able to stop wearing ties at work, and the office was redecorated to be more fun, with a Superman statue installed in the lobby.